because we are going to talk about hyperplanes, uh, I used to usually try to explain data sets in 2D, but uh, we will try to do this in 3D. Uh, by the way, when you say hyperplanes, that means uh, uh, n minus 1 linear space in Rn. So, if, for example, if you have a four-dimensional space, it's impossible to imagine what it looks like, but let's say you can imagine four-dimensional space, then you can think of a three-dimensional subspace in there. Okay. Uh, so there's a, a co-dimension one difference between these two things. Just like in, in 3D, uh, any plane is two-dimensional embedded in 3D, right? Yeah. So, uh, two dimensions are, uh, no, planes in 3D is an example of a hyperplane. Okay? But as you go higher dimensions, uh, you just increase the hyper dimension, uh, hyperspaces dimension as well. Now, why do we talk about hyperdimensions? Well, uh, we've been talking about, about this xi then y i, where xi i's are like feature sets, right? So, uh, for example, if we wanted to figure out the uh, the type of iris flower that, that we were doing last time, right? Then we had four features, right? So that's like in four dimensions. We were working in four dimensions, and from that four dimension data. We have a we have a label, uh, which told us which flower, which type of flower it was. So so we were able to figure that out. So uh, if you think about the classification in 4D, what is this? You're you're basically saying that there's uh, if it's a bi binomial classification, uh, binary classification. So you have like group A and group B, which could be separated by uh, something like this. Well, think about this picture in 4D. In 4D, when you divide, this entire space will be four-dimensional, and this thing that divides will be one-dimensional less. It will be a three-dimensional object. So this thing that divides will be a hyperplane. Is that okay? All right, so that's why we, we talk about hyperplanes. And the best way to... What? Is that R is in real numbers? Oh yeah, yeah. R, R, R is in real numbers. So, so if you say, say uh, R two, that means it's a plane, right? Because what's a plane? It's a tuple of two real numbers, right? Yeah. If you say R three, that's the the space, the three dimensional space. Okay. All right. So. Uh, Let's imagine that uh, we have a binary classification problem with uh, the feature being three-dimensional, three, three things. Okay, so that means uh, we now have data sets on the space, right? And there's one data here, another data here. And, and of course, uh, in general, we want to put uh, we want to have like group of data here, group of another data here, and we want to figure out the uh, bound, uh, decision <laughs> boundary, which will be like a plane between them. But uh, let's try to simplify things by just thinking about just two two points. Okay, just two points. So this one belongs to group A. I meant to draw an X there group A and that's group, group B, or let's say this is group 0 and this is group 1. Okay. And then uh, the logistic regression classifier uh, was basically a, a multivariable function supported on dimension 3 where it smoothly changes between 0 and 1, right? So it, it would get 0 values somewhere near here and then there's this uh, uh, 
decision boundary and then it slowly becomes one near there. That's, that's what logistic uh, function looks like, right? That we were using that to uh, do the classification last time. Uh, and that really, to, to really understand what's going on with the logistic regression, you, you need to have a deeper understanding of probability. But then there is this uh, whole new way of approaching this, which says, well, we don't care probability. We just want classification. Okay. So uh, instead of thinking of all these uh, hard pro probability stuff, you just say, let's just focus on getting the best decision boundary or the plane that is in between them. Right. So let's think about what's like the best plane that will be dividing the two. Is that okay? Now, uh, if you view it kind of perpendicularly here so that uh, it looks like two dimensions, here's what, what we're trying to do. We're merely trying to find the dividing line between them so that these two are classified. If it's on the right side, it's going to be 1, on the left side it will be 0, something like that. Okay. And uh, then well, what you want to say is that, well, what makes this boundary better than, say, another boundary like that? Okay. And, yeah? Uh, oh, never mind. Yeah. Do you want to s uh, I'd say because you're just getting the most precise. Um, most precise, okay. Uh, Anyone else? What, what makes this this one uh, this one better than this this other boundary? Yeah. Uh, the original boundary is more defined. More defined. Which, which allows the more original boundary is perpendicular. That that's kind of near. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's that's what's going to happen uh, eventually. But here here's a a nice way to argue for that. You say that this boundary between the two points is better than this one because if you think about this one, you can think of the, the distance between the, the plane and to the point. Uh, this is still three-dimensional, so this is really a plane, not, not a line, okay? It's not overlap. So, so the, the, these, the sum of these two lengths, okay, if you think about it, uh, that's a lot smaller than this distance plus that distance. That's, that's a lot bigger, right? You, you agree, right? Yeah. So, so uh, if you have just two points and you want to find the best classifying boundary, I guess what you want is something that would pass through the midpoint, but with the property that the distance between that plane to this point is maximized. Okay, that's that's the that's the idea of support vector machines. Okay. Once, once you set the goal, everything else is just uh, math. You just do complicated math to make sure that this is what you're aiming for. Okay? All right. Uh, so I, I want to slowly uh, work, work towards to getting this goal in terms of math, but just to uh, give you some more ideas of what's going to happen in general is that uh, suppose you have bunch of data points here and then a bunch of data points here so that this is group 0 and group, group 1, then this, the, the, the boundary that's going to change uh, should really be like this. You, you would think about these two parallel lines and then use the midpoint, uh, the, the middle, oh, these are parallel planes, sorry, so uh, these are parallel planes and then you want to have the parallel plane that goes exactly in the middle, right? So that, this is going to be our uh, decision boundary, uh, hyperplane, um, and what that also tells us is that the data points that are here really doesn't contribute. It's really the, the ones that are further inside uh, that makes the decision harder, uh, that's deciding what this hyperplane should be, right? So uh, these, 
these points here, notice that these are points in three-dimensional space if, it, if the feature dimension is three or higher dimensions, right? So these are array of numbers, really. These are array of numbers, so it's really a vector, okay? And because these define the hyperplane, these are called support vectors. Okay, so these, these, maybe I should use a different color. So these ones, these three, those are called support vectors. And thus the name support vector machines, which is like a, a machinery where you just keep trying to figure out what's the best decision boundary to use. Right. Okay. Uh, so I guess the downside compared to the logistic regression is that uh, logistic regression will give you the probability of being in one class or the other and then say if the value is very close to one then you can confidently say that this classification is trustworthy and if the value is close to zero or, or that's another rate uh, another uh, that, that will tell you that uh, the classification it shouldn't be classified in, in that group uh, so there's something that that logistic regression does better, which is to give you the probability. On the other hand, support vector machines just does the classification. It doesn't really tell you uh, how trustworthy this classification is. Okay, so that would be the big difference. On the other hand, uh, the the actual computation for doing the support vector machines because it's, it's just doing, doing a simpler thing than the logistic regression, uh, it can handle bigger data. Okay. So in that sense, you know, if the algorithms are easier, then it can process bigger things. If the algorithm is complicated, then it takes a long time to uh, process things. So uh, support vector machines are superior to logistic regression in the sense that um, it, it's simpler, so it can handle bigger data. And uh, really, support vector machines were popular in the 90s because uh, even with the computational power back then, it could do some impress imp uh, impressible things like uh, recognizing digits, stuff like that. Uh, but then uh, nowadays, the computers became more powerful, and uh, with that, uh, the deep neural network kind of took over. And uh, so, so what happened is that there's, there's a lot of math developed for the support vector machines to be effectively trained and do uh, awesome things. Uh, but nowadays, I, I feel like, uh, like it, it's not worthwhile to invest your time learning all the math behind it. Uh, you just need to know what it's doing and then some ideas, uh, because sometimes it, it, it's nice to have support vector machines for quick stuff. If you, can't, if you don't have access to powerful machines, maybe support vector machines are the things that you want to use. Uh, but uh, uh, if you're trying to really go deeper into uh, machine learning, I would suggest that rather than using support vector machines, uh, try to learn more about deep neural networks. Okay. All right. Um, so, now let me try to uh, tell you the format of the line equation, so uh, the plane equation. Uh, can you tell me what the plane equation looks like? Just give me an example of a plane equation in 3D. X plus y plus z equals y. Yeah, x plus y. No, no, that equals x plus y plus z equals to 1. Right? So that, that would be a plane equation. This gives you a plane. Uh, I mean, the way to see it is that you have z equals to 1 minus x minus y. So uh, if you're given two points on the x, x, y plane, it gives you a height, right? And the, the value of z is changing linearly with respect to x and y, so you can kind of see that the graph should be like flat. So this will give you a plane. Uh, 
in, in general, what it looks like is, in general, planes look like a times x plus by plus cz equals to what? Now, because we're using y for the labels uh, rather than using x, y, and z, uh, we're going to be using w1, x1 plus w2, x2 uh, plus w3, x3 equals to, oh, not 1, sorry, d. d. Okay, so, uh, so here, w1 is a, w2 is b, w3 is c, and then instead of x, y, and z, we are using x1, x2, x3. Okay, so hopefully, uh, you know, indices, index, indices uh, freak people out. They, they get really afraid once, see, once they see a lot of indices. But uh, just, just keep telling yourself, oh, it's, these are just coordinates. x1, x2, x3 are just some coordinates, x, y, z. And then uh, w1, w2, w3, we use w's because uh, traditionally in machine learning, these are called weights. Uh, they, they, reasons why, there are reasons why you call them weights, but anyways, these are called weights. Uh, yeah, well, okay, well, uh, because these x1, x2, x3 are features, if you have a high value of w1, that means uh, this x1 feature is weighted more. It, the, the machine thinks that this feature is very important if this value is big. That's why it's called weights. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in the, in the view of weight machine learning, these are called weights, and those are like A, B, C. And then uh, you have some, some value D. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, since this is a constant, uh, let me just divide D into, I'll put B here instead. So B is like negative D, but then, uh, just like that. But then uh, I could also change this value to anything. It'll still be some kind of a plane. Do you agree? It'll still be a plane. Right? But uh, now let me ask, uh, what would changing D do? Uh, so, so you kind of already know this in 2D, right? In 2D, how does the line equation look like? This is how, how line equations look like in 2D, right? Okay. So uh, this is called a standard form of the line. Uh, you probably know uh, y equals to mx plus b. Uh, that's the slope intercept form. Uh, but then if you want to change this to this, you just have to solve for y. And if you solve for y, you see that uh, this, this y-intercept thingy is really uh, negative b, c over b. Right? So what it means is that if you change c, the y-intercept changes. So what does this mean? That means that the, the lines go up and down. Which is perfect because it's like this. If I want to figure out where to place this uh, plane, if I want to control it, it's controlled by two things. First, the weights. The weights are related to the slope. Okay. I'll give you another way to think about the weights a little later, but it's, it's like the slope, the slantedness, which direction it's, it's, it's being slanted, okay? And then this D controls movement. You can just move to one direction. Or we actually don't know, uh, uh, I mean, planes only move, I mean, if you, if you take a plane, you move it like that or move it like that, it's the same thing, right? Because it's an infinite plane, so you don't know if a plane is moving this way or that way. Uh, it's just moving. Okay. It's, uh, so this thing just moves parallelly. So changing D changes the plane parallelly. Is that okay? All right. So now here's here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to set this one. So I'm going to first write this as W1, W2, W3. This row vector times the column vector, right? And uh, because vectors for us are uh, by default columns, uh, this should really be written as, so th th that equation is like wt times x plus b equals to zero. 
Is that okay? Yeah. So this, this is, I'm calling this vector w, I'm calling this vector as x. So this, this x is a, a, a feature vector. This w is the weight vector. Okay? And if you do wt times x, that's really the dot product between two vectors. This, this is the dot product, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have the dot product and then uh, plus b, and this kind of moves things parallelly. And I want this one to be the equation for the, the decision boundary. All right. Now, uh, wt x plus b equals to 1. I want it to be this one. Okay. And this one here, I want it to be wt b equals to negative 1. Oh, no, wt, wt x plus b equals to negative 1. So uh, I want to have the, so when, when a decision boundary is picked, I want to make it so that uh, if you get negative 1, it's going to hit one end of the uh, support vectors. Uh, if wt plus x, uh, wtx plus b is equal to 1, it's going to hit the other uh, support vectors. Okay. Uh, the 1 and negative 1 is just some convenient numbers uh, we chose. Uh, the thing is, if you have a plane equation, you can just divide both sides by 2, and the plane itself doesn't change because the same set of x, y, z will satisfy this equation that's modified. So there's still uh, some kind of a choice you can make. So, oh, sir. yes. Your laptop is running a little better. Oh, thank you. So, so let, let's come back to this picture. So, so here's what I'm trying to say. I know that because the decision boundary will be exactly in the middle of these two parallel things, if this value is, say, c, then this value will be negative c. Do you agree? It has to be that. Okay. But then, because there's the freedom to divide by any number you want, you can divide both sides by c so that, and then redefine these values so that these values will just be negative 1 and 1. So that's why this, this requirement is OK. So that's what we want. OK. So uh, that's the format we want. But then now, let's think about the requirement that we want this plane to be as far away to this point as possible. OK. So, uh, in other words, I want the distance between these parallel planes to be as far as you can. I want it to be very, very far. Okay? All right. So in order to do that, uh, we first have to go back to this equation that we were talking about. Uh, OK, so I. S s yes? Do we want those planes, uh, those, those arbitrary planes, to be equidistant from each other uh, to the... So, so I want this, this uh, black line to be, black plane to be exactly in the middle of the two dotted planes. Okay. So exactly in the middle, okay. Exactly in the middle. That's why you can say if this is, if this is zero and this is C, this should be negative C. Okay. Okay, right. okay so uh, let's, since uh, these uh, the subscripts uh, makes things too complicated. Let's just rewrite this like that, rewrite this <coughs> like that, and, and think about how to uh, compute the distance between them. <coughs> Fine? Right. Now, first of all, remember that this is a dot product between the two vectors. 
Let me see if you learned your multivariable calculus well. If two dot product gives you zero, what do we know about them? They're orthogonal, right? They're, they're perpendicular, right? So uh, here's the picture. Uh, zero comma zero comma zero is definitely on this plane, right? So here's the zero comma zero comma zero. And then uh, let's pick another point x comma y comma z. And think of x comma y comma z as a vector because uh, this, this notation only makes sense if it's a vector. And then uh, we have to think about a, b, c as some vector and they have to be orthogonal. Now in this relationship, look, a, b, c is fixed and x, y, z could be any value that satisfied the equation, right? So uh, it, for, for this picture to still hold for any x, y, comma, z, you can just pick any other point that, where this is still perpendicular, right? So if you think of it this way, what kind of plane do you end up getting? You get a plane that is perpendicular to a, comma, b, comma, c. Right? That's something that you learned in, in Calc 3. Okay, and we call this a, comma, b, comma, c as a normal vector to the plane. So it, it, for example, if you had 2x minus y plus z equals to 0, then, and if you were asked what's the normal vector to this plane, you know that it was 2 comma negative 1 comma 1. So in, in 3D, basically the, the, the ABC, we were, which was what we were calling the weight vectors, they control the direction of the plane. Yeah, just like the, uh, in a 2D uh, line equation, there's the slope and the intercept, right? So here you have the normal vector, which control the directions, and, and the, the, this extra thing, that gives you uh, the, what is it, uh, the, the translation, okay. parallel translation. Okay. All right, so, uh, so now let's think about this other one. What is this then? That, that's like, uh, as I said, you went from 0 to 1, so it's going to be, another plane shifted in some direction. I have no idea what it is, all right? Okay. So, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to pick a point, random point in here, in, in this one. Okay, so, so x, y, z is now from the second plane, all right? Random point here, and uh, the distance between these two uh, these two planes is really the perpendicular distance uh, in this direction. Right. So it's the distance between the distance between these two planes is, is this direction. So here's the picture. I have x, y, z going off of the original plane, but then this original plane has a normal vector a comma b comma c in this direction. So, so some, this is a comma b comma c. That's the normal direction. Okay? And the distance that we want is really the orthogonal projection towards to this side. You just have to take this vector and projecting them to this side. And if you project it, this length right here, that gives you the, the distance. Okay, so what I want is I want to project x comma y comma z onto the a, b, c direction. Okay. How do you do that? Uh, projection formula, that, does anyone remember how to project a vector to another one? Using the dot product? Huh? It's almost like just a dot product, except that for that formula, you need the, the, this other vector to be uh, magnitude? Uh, unit vector. You need a unit vector. Okay, very good. So this is really x, y, z dotted with a, b, c over norm of a, b, c. Isn't that right? But look, what is this? This is ax plus by plus cz over norm of abc. I know what this is if it satisfies here. What is it? What is this equal to? 
one, right? So now you know that this is one. And this, that, this thing in here is the, the weight vector, okay? Yes? Um, where are you saying x, y, and z is? Is that like from one plane to another plane? No, no, no. Uh, x, y, z is now a point in the sec second plane. That's like slightly shifted. And then a, b, and c? A, b, c is the, the vector that's perpendicular to both of these planes. It's like you have so the these two planes like plane. going that way. Yeah. Okay. And I'm saying that if you have this vector, you just have to project this vector onto the, perpendic the, the normal vector and that gives you the distance between the two planes. So, and then we just figured out that the distance between the two planes is 1 over w. And therefore, if you want the entire width, it will be 2 over norm of w. Okay? So now here comes the punchline. So what's our conclusion? Uh, conclusion. If classification problem, classification problem is linearly separable, uh, uh, meaning that you know there's some in all cases which logistic regression could handle naturally that, you know, sometimes you might have something in here, right? So uh, this, this way, if you cut it like that, then this will be misclassified. So when I say, maybe I should say strictly linearly separable, meaning that you don't have this. You can just, you, if your data set is really simple, that there's like uh, a decision boundary which you can make it to work 100%. If that's true, then, then <coughs> the decision boundary boundary of a support vector machine or classifier, I'll just say classifier, support vector classifier, uh, decision boundary of a support vector classifier is the one that maximizes, maximizes what? 2 over norm of W. Okay. So out of all the hyperplanes that you can draw, you want the one that would ma maximize this. Oh, I shouldn't have raised this other one. Uh, so uh, let me now rephrase what the support vector machine is doing. So suppose you have uh, some x's here, then some other group here, and then you, you do this. Then uh, first of all, you, you know that because this is wt w plus b equals to 1, and this is wt w, no, wt x. wt x plus b equals to negative 1. Uh, this, if you think about this function, wt x plus b, it goes from negative 1 to 1 uh, linearly here, but because this is a linear function, if you continue on, uh, for this group 1, this will be 1 or greater. Okay, so from here, what's going to happen is that it's going to be this. On, on this side, what's going to happen is it's going to be this. Okay? And uh, for simplicity, we're going to, instead of using the labels as 0 and 1, let's just say the label here is that y i's, so if for these x's, uh, the i elements, here, let's say this, this label is negative 1, and let's say this label is positive 1 for binary classification. So if you label it that way, then uh, if yi is negative 1, we know that wt x plus b will be always less than negative 1, 
Whereas on, on this side, wt x plus b will be always greater than 1. And you can put those two together in a simple way by putting yi times wt x plus b uh, greater or equals to 1. And it's kind of neat, right? You, you, you've managed to write two equations into one by saying that if yi is 1, then it's just this equation. If yi is negative 1, then you can divide both sides by negative 1, and you get this equation. So this single equation will give you both. Is that OK? All right. So this is our condition. And what we want is that under this condition, we want to maximize this. But this is same thing. Maximizing this is same thing as minimizing norm of w squared. Because, uh, you know, like trying to work with the fraction is not good, so we, we flip it. When is this maximized? When, when the denominator is minimized, right? So we do that, and then uh, we also put a square there, because if, if you have w squared, that's the same as w dotted with itself. That's a fa very famous identity that you learned in Calc 3. And uh, in, in our matrix notation, this will be w transpose times w. Okay? So uh, this is what you, you have. And uh, we like to use this one rather than just w norm itself because w norm, if you write down the formula explicitly, it has a square root. And it, it's not so pleasant trying to differentiate that. So instead of that, we put the square so it's easier to differentiate. So uh, now we can write down the hard boundary SBC. Hard boundary support vector classifier would be to uh, minimize the weight vector squared uh, with the condition that yi wt, oh, for, for each of xi, sorry, wt xi plus b has to be greater or equal to 1. That's hard boundary support vector classifier. OK. So um, now let's move on to soft boundary. Uh, this is not going to be very effective in many cases because in real life, there are many cases where two things are pretty close together and you can't really have a hard boundary, right? So if your data set is some, somewhat like that, so it's like you, you have to do something like that, this hard boundary problem will not be solvable because you can't really uh, satisfy this condition for any, any line. You can't. Like, no matter which way you try to draw the line, this condition cannot be met, right? So you, you, you somehow have to loosen this condition. And uh, what you do is uh, you, you have the idea of a penalty. So what's a penalty? You allow something to happen. You allow the lines to go beyond. So uh, for, for these, this inequality will be violated. For this one, this will, inequality will, again, be violated. But any time you violate, you measure how much it violates, and you include that in, the, uh, in, in your cost function. So anything that you try to minimize, this is your cost function. Right? So uh, as I explained, uh, in the logistic regression case, we had the cost function where it was the negative log likelihood. I was trying to explain that. I don't know how, how much you understood. But that, that, but that was, in, in most of these uh, machine learning algorithms, well, not most, but many of the uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, they try to minimize this cost function. That's how they train the machine. Um, but included in this cost function now, we're going to say, uh, we're going to say minimize instead norm of W squared plus uh, the average 
final issues. And this is how you do it. You, you say max of 0 comma 1 minus yi wt xi plus b. Okay? So you do that. And then you put some constant c here so that you can control the you can control the co co cost. Okay, so let's see what this does. See, if you write this, you see that if you if you write this so that this is moved to the right side, you get you get the following. Now, this one says that any time this is negative, this is maintained so it's good. Okay? If, if this is negative, then max of 0 and the negative will give you 0, which means <coughs> no harm done. No harm is done to the, the cost function. So that's good. Okay? We like that. Right? On the other hand, if this becomes positive, that means if this is positive, then this inequality is no longer true. right? Then in that case, the maximum of a 0 and a positive number will just give you this one. But then if this becomes very positive, that means it's violated a lot. Do you agree? Yeah. Uh, if it's violating only just a little bit, then basically this distance, it's related to this distance. Not exactly that one, but it's somehow related to that distance. And, and, and therefore, if that, this value is small, then this penalty will be small so that uh, the, the overall cost function won't be that big. So by including this penalty, you, ha you end up with a uh, support vector classifier uh, that can draw a boundary even if some of the boundary values are mixed. So that's, that's the soft one. So this, this is the one that uh, the scikit-learn uh, has. Now, uh, furthermore, and uh, you know, at this point, uh, I, I can s start more math there, but it's going to be just too much. But so I'm just going to write down the result. Uh, so y you learned in uh, Calc three that if you have a bound boundary uh, with some maximization or minimization uh, on a boundary. Uh, there's a method called Lagrangian multipliers, okay? Yeah. So uh, you can formulate this into another boundary, uh, boundary maximization problem, and you can use Lagrange multiplier. And if you work that out, uh, it's going to be like several, another like more than 40 minutes, and it will be even more com complicated. So I, I decided not to do that one, but it's like this. This, this question changes to the following, maximize... f of c1 through cn equal to, and, and I, don't, I don't remember the formulas, which means that you don't really have to know this. <coughs> but I, I have to discuss something about this, so I still want to write that. y i c i x t x i y j y j c j and so this is like a sum over i and then j, both going from one to n. And then uh, with the condition that n uh, ci, yi should be <coughs> 0, and then ci should be big or equal to 0, and then 1 over 2 n lambda. So it's a, like some long calculation. You have to change this into another boundary form, and then apply the uh, Lagrange multiplier, and then do all math, this is what you get. Uh, but I still have to show you what this is because now comes another separate idea of something called a kernel trick. So what, what's a kernel trick? Let's talk about the kernel trick. Suppose your data set is distributed like this. Now, how are you going to classify this? 
it's not linearly separable, right? There's no way to draw a plane, hyperplane, to divide these two things. Do you agree? Yeah. So, uh, that's going to be not solvable by a, a usual support vector classifier. Okay. Uh, in that case, what you do is you apply a kernel, and uh, vaguely, it's an idea where you apply another function to this so that they become distinguished. So, for example, if this was in, in a plane, <coughs> and suppose you, you take a third value where the value of the third, third z-axis is x squared plus y squared, what's going to happen then? The things close to zero is going to have smaller z value because x squared plus y squared is the distance from the origin squared, right? Things around here will have bigger value. So now suddenly you have a z axis where you have things, the, the, the round ones close to the, the xy plane, whereas the x ones having bigger value. And, and there I can just have a hyperplane dividing the two. Neat, right? So that's called the kernel trick. Now, the kernel trick, uh, the actual kernel trick that's used in uh, the support vector classifier is basically what you want to do is you want to take that function that you're trying to maximize and change some part uh, by applying a nonlinear function. And, and, and the, the place that it applies the nonlinear function is right here. That's why I wrote this down. Okay? See, this is dot product of two, two vectors, right? So it's a simple dot product. It's a, it's a dot product is a bilinear function. It's, it's linear in the first component and the second component. But you replace this by k x i x j. Sorry, the, one of them should be j. So that uh, see dot product measures how similar two things are. Right? If they are pointing at different directions, then their their directions are very different, they, they, uh, they're perpendicular. But if you, if you have higher dot products, that means they're pointing to similar directions, which means the features are similar. Right? So that's what this dot product is doing. And uh, if you replace this by that, then now you've, you've put in some extra dimension, uh, extra nonlinearity to this so that your decision boundary could be curved. So that's, that's what this does. And now this becomes really powerful. Uh, now you can, you can uh, do classifications even if it's like this, okay? And, uh, and uh, one of the most popular ones, the, the one that the scikit-learn has by default is something called, this, this one is called RBF, radial basis functions. And some people just think uh, kernel trick just means radial basis functions, uh, which is not, but yeah. RBF, radial basis functions, and it's like this. If you have uh, xi vector minus uh, k xi vector and y uh, xj vector, you have two vectors, then what you do is you, you have to do e to the negative gamma times norm of xi vector minus xj vector norm. So if you take the difference between two vectors, that gives you the distance, right? And then you take the norm. So you, 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 you calculate the distance. You multiply by some constant gamma, constant. And then you put it on the exponential function. And uh, if these two things are close together, then it gives you a high value. If they are very far apart, then it gives you a low value, right? Because this value comes back, okay? So uh, overall, uh, we, we did a lot of math, uh, but we also skipped like more than half of it because I, I, I didn't tell you how, how the Lagrange multiplier goes. Uh, but here, here's the takeaway. When you're using support vector classifier in scikit-learn, then uh, there's some coefficients you can meddle with. Right? Or you can even change the, the kernel function. Uh, by default, it's using RBF, but you can use uh, some other like polynomial kernels and, and different, you can, you can like try figuring out which ones are good. Uh, but uh, because of this, this C here, and this, this gamma that I was talking about, because these are used in the minimizer, 
uh, changing these values will change the decision boundary somewhat. Okay. Uh, so, so for example, increasing C would mean that you have higher penalty for violating the inequality, which means if you have a very high C, that's almost like hard boundary so, uh, to support vector classifier. Does that make sense? Okay, and then what about gamma? Uh, again, if gamma is big, no, uh, if gamma is, yeah, if gamma is big, then, then the, the distance would, would punish it more, right? So it, it will be, uh, it will again be more hard uh, classifier, and then if this is small, then it will be softer. So uh, there are ways to plot the, the decision boundaries using this. Um, I don't have that ready today, but uh, you can kind of do the experiment with them. So uh, if you're using support vector classifier, you should always have in mind for what kind of C and gamma value to use. Often you don't, you don't have to change the C and then just change the gamma value a little bit and then see which one has a better performance. We've done the performance matrix, right? Uh, you, you, we can do the F1 score, we can do the recall, precision, all these things to see what's like an effective one. So uh, that's, that's what we're going to, to use uh, today. I mean, we're going to tweak this one a little bit to get a better performance. Right? 